Lift the wings of angels singing Alleluia. Angels singing. Noel's ringing. Gladsome tidings bringing. Christ is Lord of Infant holy, infant lowly, for his head a cattle stall. Oxen lowing, little lowing, Christ the baby is Lord of all. Swift are winging, angels singing, Noel's ringing, tidings bringing, Christ the baby. Flocks were sleeping, shepherds creeping, vigil till the morning dew. Song of glory, heard the story, tidings of all gospel true. Thus rejoicing, free from sorrow, praises voicing, greet the morrow. Christ the babe was born for you. Christ the babe was born for you. Welcome to worship and Merry Christmas. The first time I've gotten to say official Merry Christmas since the season began. Glad to have you gathered here in worship today. A lot of our folks, of course, are still on the road getting back to us, including Joy and Steve Rotz. So I appreciate uh, Joe and Becky Salter being here today. They are friends of Joy and Steve, co music colleagues, and Joe's leading our music today. Thank you. Uh, and the travels may have brought other guests our way today, and I uh, hope if that's the case, you've been made to feel welcome already. Certainly, this travel weekend means more of you are worshiping online with us or on television, and so a welcome to you as well, and Merry Christmas, and I uh, look forward to beginning the new year uh, tuned in with you or having you here in the room. Uh, for those who are, are here in the room, if you're a guest, Please uh, give attention to the guest card in the pew rack in front of you, but also we'd love for you to stay around a little while after worship. In the narthex, we have a gift for you, but more uh, important, we've got an occasion uh, to get to know you and welcome you more personally. Let's pray together. Oh God, we gather in expectation and we pray that you meet us here in our need on the eve of a new year approaching we pray that you would start something new in us that it would start because we have gathered this hour for worship and so open our hearts to expectation Open up our spirits to what you may want to say and nudge and do within us. Meet us where we are, but don't leave us where we are. Change us for the sake of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Will you please stand for a Christmas carol medley? We'll sing Angels from the Realm of Glory and right into Good Christian Friends Rejoice.
Our first scripture reading this morning is Psalm 148. It's a wonderful psalm of praise. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his host. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let's the, praise the name of the Lord. For he commanded and they were created. He established them forever and ever. He fixed their bounds which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps. Fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind fulfilling his command. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and women alike, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people. Praise for all his faithful. Pr for the people of Israel who are close to him, praise the Lord. Please stand for our hymn, Gentle Mary Laid Her Child. you to remain standing as we sing the congregational anthem together two wonderful songs of christmas tide joy to the world and O come all ye faithful you'll find your text or lyrics to the songs on the back of your worship bulletin
Our hearts are filled with joy with the birth of Christ, and we come to this place to adore him, the newborn king. My guess is that during this Christmas season, you have heard the words from Luke 2, that familiar Christmas story. You've perhaps heard them read in worship services. If you've been here, you have. Perhaps in family gatherings, as you came together as a family, you read them. You may have recited them again and again in the traditional King James Version. Today, before the month comes to an end and before all the decorations come down, I invite you to hear just two verses of that familiar Christmas story from Luke chapter 2. I'll begin with verse 6. I invite you to listen and we'll think about these verses, hearing them again almost for the first time. Listen to what God might say to you. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Would you join me as we say our prayers together? Gracious God, we have been drawn to the manger this past week to experience again your grace and love given to us in the baby born in Bethlehem. We thank you that your son left his throne in the glory of heaven to enter our world to be our Savior. We gather to worship today in gratitude for his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. We all need to hear again the message of Christmas that you are with us. Enter our darkness and bring your light. Come into our pain and bring your healing. Walk with us in our weakness and fill us with your strength. Draw near to us as we repent of our sins and offer your forgiveness. We pray, dear God, that our experience together in these few moments will deepen our commitment to following Jesus as the Lord of our lives. With Christmas still ringing in our hearts, we also gather today on the last Sunday of the year with dreams and expectations for the new year. Open our eyes to see the new thing that you're going to do in our lives, in our families, our church, our community, our nation, and our world. The wonder of your creative work in our lives is already springing forth. Give us the vision to perceive what you are doing and eagerness to join in your work in our world. With hope and expectation, we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand for the hymn, number 165, Thou Didst Leave Thy Throne.
Every great drama requires a villain, and the Christmas story is no exception. Now, by my way of thinking, King Herod should have been the bad guy in the Christmas story. But think about how we have told this story again and again and interpreted it from our pulpits and in our churches. The one who usually comes out as the villain in this Christmas story is the innkeeper, right? That innkeeper, you know how it goes. The preachers declare, I have heard a number of sermons, that this innkeeper was too busy too preoccupied, too greedy, too absorbed in himself to pay attention to lowly Mary and Joseph as they arrived and knocked on his door, and he sent them away. What a scoundrel. I've heard sermons about that. But where the innkeeper really has a hard time is in our children's Christmas pageants. You know what I'm talking about. The one who plays the innkeeper is the big older kid whose voice is starting to change, right? And Mary and Joseph arrive and knock on the door. And then it's that character in his bathrobe. It's his job to step forward and sound as gruff as possible. No room in the inn. You've seen this. And Mary and Joseph turn, and in almost a pitiful way, they make their way away. Over the years, we have made the innkeeper (laughs) the villain in the Christmas story. That is really quite a portrayal for someone who is never even mentioned in the Bible. All the Bible says is because there was no room for them in the inn. I must admit that I grew up with a different story playing in my mind, a a different explanation, a different narrative. You see, my dad uh, was a New Testament scholar. And years ago, when I was just a child, he began working on this and digging into the Greek language and the biblical text. What does Luke 2, verses 6 and 7, what do they actually say? And he offered a sermon called In Defense of an Innkeeper, in which... The innkeeper was not the villain. In fact, the innkeeper becomes a model for who we are to be in offering up our lives as followers of Jesus. That made sense to me as a boy. And as I then entered ministry, I've I've shared his biblical interpretation on this point in every church I've ever served. I guess it's time for me to do that right here. And so before we do take the decorations down, before we stop singing the Christmas carols, maybe we go back and look one more time at this story of Christmas. And maybe look at it with some fresh eyes and listening with ears where we've not heard the story told this way. And perhaps as we stand on this Sunday knocking on the door of the new year, something that we can learn from this story of Christmas will shape the way that we live as followers of Jesus in 2019. So let's take a new look at the old, old story. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Verse 6. Well, let's begin by rethinking the timeline that we often assume for the Christmas story. We usually imagine, I've seen this in, in pageants, heard it 
preached. We usually imagine that Mary and Joseph arrived in Bethlehem on the night she was to give birth. It's almost as if the labor pains were beginning. And so when they knocked on the door and that no vacancy sign was put out, it was just, it made it that much worse to turn her away at that critical hour, that critical moment. Is that how it happened? Well, the journey from Nazareth, where they lived, to Bethlehem is 80 to 90 miles. That is four or five days of hard riding on the back of a donkey. Now I need the help of every woman in the room who has given birth to someone. Just imagine that scenario, starting out on a journey like that, four or five days before delivery, it may be possible, but is it plausible? So is it possible that the story started off a little differently than we imagine for Mary and Joseph to be knocking on the door on the night when a baby was to be born? Well, let's listen again to the Bible. Not just how we've always imagined it. Let's listen to the Bible, which says, while they were there. Meaning, while Mary and Joseph were in Bethlehem, while they were there. What could that tell us? Let's go back in our story. Back to Luke chapter 1. Verse 56, it it tells about the time when after the angel visited Mary with this incredible news that she would give birth to the Son of God, but this birth would come in a miraculous way before she had known her husband. She just had to talk that through with someone, and she goes off to be with Elizabeth, wife of Zechariah, who has also had an incredible um, bit of news, and the two of them begin sharing their hearts together. And Luke 1, 56 tells us that she remained with Elizabeth for three months. And then she returned to Nazareth. Is it possible that when she came back to Nazareth, the child growing within her begins to show? We know that Joseph who was not yet married to her. They were not a married couple, but we know that Joseph cared about her and did not want her to be disgraced or embarrassed. We read about that in Matthew 1. Is it possible that Joseph, who knew that this census was being taken in Bethlehem and that he had to go to register as the male, she didn't have to go. He did. Is it possible that Joseph wanted to take her away from the gossiping tongues around the well in Nazareth as they began to talk about this unmarried woman who was starting to look different. I think that's possible. Joseph was a carpenter. He could easily get work wherever he went. Is it possible that he said to Mary, come with me? Let's go to Bethlehem. They don't know us so much there. And we'll stay until there's a birth. And so, it is possible that they headed on to Bethlehem and actually stayed there for months as the child grew within her. He could have easily found work and... They could have lodged there and remained there for some months. For the scripture does say, while they were there. So while they were there, where did they stay? Verse 7 of Luke 2 says, in the inn. Now here's where we need to get just a little technical and, and learn some Greek. Are you staying with me okay? I don't want anything to, you know, put you to sleep. But It's key, these Greek words, because they really do help us understand the story. 
In the New Testament and in the Gospel of Luke, there are two words in the Greek that are used for and are translated in. Two different words. The first is pandokian. Pan means all. Dekomai means to receive. So you put those together. A pandokian was the kind of place that received all. It's like the holiday inn of their day where people would come and find lodging. In fact, there's a place where we read about that, Luke 10, verse 34. It's in the story Jesus told of the Good Samaritan. Remember that story? The Good Samaritan finds a man who is, is broken and beaten, and he helps him and takes him where? To an inn. And he paid the innkeeper to take care of him. And that word right there in Luke 10 is this word pandokian. He took him to a place that would receive all, and that was the end. But that's not the word used in Luke 2. The word used in Luke 2 is a second word that's sometimes translated in, it's the word kataluma, kataluma. And then we might ask, well, does it show up anywhere else in the Gospel of Luke, for example, that might help us link it and understand what it is? And sure enough, Luke 22, starting with verse 10 and following, Jesus is giving his disciples instructions about how to prepare for the Passover. You remember this? Jesus says, listen, he said to them, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house he enters. And say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs already furnished, make preparations there. That word translated in our Bible, guest room, it's the word kataluma. In other words, it's the same word used in Luke 2 for in, a guest room. So we start to think about the timeline and the Greek language. Is it possible that Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem five or six months before a birth, and instead of staying in the kind of inn where you might bed down for the night overnight, they were in a guest room, perhaps a family, or someone else who would have a guest room, a kataluma, an upstairs, upper room, guest room, where they lived and lodged for some of these months. So that by the time the birth came, that they knew the family, the owner, may have even been family, living in this kataluma, this guest room above. We've got to keep going a little bit more with some Greek. Because the next phrase, because there was no room for them. No room for them. The word room in the Greek is the word topos, T-O-P-O-S. Our word topography comes from that. It literally means place. In fact, if you opened up your pew Bible right now and looked at this same passage I'm reading, it will say there was no place for them in the end. That same word, topos, um, in John chapter 14, one of those beloved passages that we often bring out at a funeral time, Jesus said, I go to prepare a place, and the word is topos. I go to prepare a place for you. So that's the word that's used here. There was no place for them. Now start to put all this together. Could it be that when it says and when we talk about there was no room 
in the end, is it possible that there was no appropriate place for a child to be born? You see, any time a child was born, because there was blood involved in that, that in the ritualistic um, uh, rules of Judaism, that would create an unclean space in that house and until there was purification would defile the whole house. It was common practice to empty the house for the birth to happen. Is it possible that a homeowner host who had grown to know Mary and Joseph over months realized as the time was approaching for birth that there was not an appropriate place You see, these homes in those days, there was not much privacy there. If you go to Israel today, you can see some uh, reenactments or replicas of um, what these homes would have been like. You see it in Nazareth, for example. There would be a courtyard that's open air. The animals are there. There would be rooms without doors. There might have been an upper room, but no place for the privacy needed to give birth. And this homeowner knew he couldn't just turn out the whole house in a busy, crowded Bethlehem at census time. What do you do? Is it possible that this homeowner, this host, realized that there needed to be an appropriate place for a child to be born? And so while they were there for some months, Living in a guest room in a home, the owner of the home, perhaps already related to Mary and Joseph, developed a deep relationship with them, and when the time came, took extra steps to create privacy and the appropriate place in a stable for the Son of God to be born. So what if it happened that way does that make any difference (laughs) does it make any difference if the innkeeper is not the villain of the story well I've appreciated my my dad's biblical interpretation that was I didn't dig all the Greek up there that was his work but now let's think about it for us Let's think about it related to the gifts of Christmas. Many of us have been in gift exchanges here during this week. We have given gifts. We have received gifts. Maybe by looking at this story in a new and different and fresh way, we can think about the gifts we give and the gifts we receive. The homeowner, the host demonstrates compassionate generosity, I believe. Instead of being one who was a gruff monster who sent Mary and Joseph off into the night because he was too preoccupied or busy or greedy or materialistic, no, he was one who demonstrates for us compassionate generosity, who was looking out for the needs of others and wanted to make sure that he created just the right place for Jesus to be born. He gave a gift, didn't he? In fact, before the shepherds ever showed up, before the wise men came, is it possible that this homeowner was the one who gave that gift of an appropriate place, that gift of a compassionate generosity to take care of those in need. And he becomes a model for us. For you see, there, there always are people who are on the outside, who are on the fringes, who live on the margins. There are those who need a place, a place at the table of justice, a place to find dignity and hope, a place to begin again. And this innkeeper, we call him, this host, this homeowner, was one who offered a place. And in that place, I think he challenges us 
to think about how we can give the gifts of Christmas. Remember that the the little boy who was born there, he grew up. That's why we have all of the, the Christmas story. That's why we have the church, not just because he was born, but because he grew up and lived and died and was raised up again. But when he grew up, that baby born in the manger said these words, and we recorded them in Matthew 25. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Howard Thurman, An African-American theologian, educator, civil rights leader, teacher, author, preacher, wonderful guy. I love these words. almost have to quote them every Sunday after Christmas every year. It's called the work of Christmas. When the song of the angels is stilled, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are back with their flocks, the work of Christmas begins to find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to release the prisoner, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among the people, to make music in the heart. The work of Christmas, that work of Christmas may have begun long ago as a compassionate host provided the appropriate place for the Son of God to be born. And he becomes a model for us to follow, doesn't he? So our question is, as the new year begins, as we enter into 2019, will we do this work of Christmas Finding a place for all of those who may be in need. Will we do this work of Christmas to find the lost and heal the broken and feed the hungry and release the prisoner? It starts in January appropriately as we have a, a food drive to raise food for the Buckhead Christian Ministries. That's one small example of how Christmas, this work of Christmas starts again. question is, will we do this work of Christmas? I hope we can look to this compassionate, generous host and let him be our guide. Well, that says something about the gift we give, but we also receive something. You see, this, this host not only gave a gift of an appropriate place, but he received Christ didn't he he received Christ as a gift into his home into his life into his heart and that's the challenge for every one of us this Christmas not just to buzz through all the family goodies and presents and trips and parties and everything else but to stop long enough to make sure that we receive Christ into our hearts, anew and afresh, alive and vibrant once again. That's why we just sang it. Oh, come to my heart, Lord Jesus. There is room in my heart for thee. So will we not only be giving the gifts of Christmas and doing the work of Christmas in the new year, but will we be making room in our hearts for Christ this new year. 
It was the annual children's Christmas pageant. And Wallace Perling was the one chosen to play the innkeeper. He was the big kid and his voice was changing and he was in his bathrobe and he only had one line to say. And Mary and Joseph arrived seemingly on the night it was all going to happen. And they knocked at the door and Wallace opened the door and he stood there and looked at them, but he froze and didn't say his line, forgot his line, just couldn't say his line. He froze, and from off stage, some mom who was helping out, she whispered loudly, no room in the inn. And finally, he got it out <clears throat> and said, no room in the inn. And Mary and Joseph turned with that dejected look to walk off into the night. But before they had taken a couple of steps, Wallace, with a grief-stricken look on his face, he called out and he said, wait, you can have my room. You can have my room. And some people thought that the Christmas pageant was ruined. And others thought it was the greatest Christmas ever. So perhaps we can be like this innkeeper and receive Christ into our hearts, make room for Jesus in our lives. He can have our room and the throne of our hearts, and that will be the best Christmas. Would you pray with me about this? Oh God, open our minds and our hearts to listen and to learn. Stir us and move us to continue trying to understand this wonderful mystery and miracle and majesty of what happened in Bethlehem. And then as we prepare to leave the manger, let us go and do the work of Christmas, constantly letting our prayer be, come to my heart, Lord Jesus. There is room in my heart for thee. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If there is a decision that you have on your heart and you would love to share it there's not a better Sunday than this one for you to do that we're going to sing number 112 child in the manger if you're ready to join this church family believing that here's a place where together we minister and do the work of Christmas come and join us if you're ready to make room in your heart for Jesus and let him have your room come and tell us about that and enter into the ways of baptism Let's stand. Let's sing. Our pastor will be at the front to receive you. Would you stand? It has been a good final Sunday of the year. Uh, my gratitude again to Becky and Joe for leading us. I am the most fortunate pastor in all of the country to work with the staff I get to work with. My gratitude to you too, David. It has been a beautiful close uh, to this year. A reminder that we don't have services Wednesday night, but we will all be back to start our perfect attendance next Sunday for the coming year. And then next Wednesday night, all of our Wednesday night ministries kick up again. But go now. In the spirit of God, making room for Christ to be born again in you. And go in the courage for the work of the gospel so that we might do justice. And go in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
We're so delighted that you've worshiped with us this hour at Second Ponce de Leon Baptist Church. Whether you found us on our YouTube channel or have tuned in to the AIB network, we're delighted to have had you as a part of our worship this hour. Second Ponce de Leon Baptist Church is a family of believers. Beyond our worship, we have learning and service opportunities for every age group. But in addition to caring for the entire family, we're also caring for the entire person, body, mind, and spirit. In fact, the noise you hear behind me is because I'm filming today from inside our Family Life Center. This wonderful building has an indoor swimming pool, basketball court, indoor track, racquetball, fitness equipment, trainers. It's a great facility because we're trying to give attention to every age group and every part of what it means to be whole. We're ministering to the whole family. We're ministering to the whole person. I hope you'll stop by as your schedule allows and see all the ways we're trying to reach the community. I look forward to meeting you soon.